workshop was created by the University of York in 2011, really with the purpose of demonstrating the power of education, research and ideas. We started with three partners. We now work with 66 partners, including, I'm very pleased to say, the IET. We um, essentially, our ethos is to educate, entertain and inspire as many people as possible about the transformative power of research and ideas. Um, the theme this year is Secrets and Discoveries, which takes us on a huge dizzying journey. Secrets and discoveries. We like to choose themes that are intriguing and a bit different, but can cover all of the disciplines. So we have scientists, we have social scientists. We're tackling really big global issues like the future of food, the future of work, the future of cities. We're exploring the invention and the unforeseen consequences of the internet. We have a big strand on Anglo-Saxon York, really big strand on cyber security, and there's really something for everybody. Ago, released his papers. He retired in 1956, so it took a little while. And what's interesting is, is that one page out of five is still censored, is still redacted. And that surprised me, and I asked why, because the head of the uh, program was there. And he said, because even though the te technology is obsolete, the systems that he laid down for approaching cryptographic problems are still the ones we use today. The single most important paper in the history of cryptography. Uh, Friedman's great paper on the index of coincidence. What happens in the field from the Renaissance as Friedman and others were relearning it in the, in the 20th century is you get a bit of a split between two types of secret communication. Cryptography, as we tend to know now, and the much more obscure word steganography, still used but not as common. They're the same word really. In Greek they both mean hidden writing. But cryptography takes a message and garbles it systematically by either re rearranging the, the, the letters or characters or by replacing them with what's called a substitution cycle. <coughs> the other system, steganography, is, is the one that you've already seen an example of, which is where the, 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 the message is kept intact, but it's hidden behind something that doesn't look like a cipher. Tell you a little bit about my answer, and you probably know more about him, about him anyway, uh, and just sort of draw out some things about uh, code breaking uh, and the significance of his work during World War II. Um, I'm going to sort of fast forward to uh, 1938, when, if you can imagine the time just around about the Munich crisis, um, Alan Turing had just come back from spending couple of years at Princeton, studying amongst other people with uh, John von Neumann, mm. um, and uh, uh, he wrote to one of his friends at King's College Cambridge, he expected on his return to find the back lawn, you know the thing that you always see in all the pictures of King's College Cambridge, the chapel and the, you know, the backs, and it's all very beautiful, and he expects to see the back lawn crisscrossed with trenches because of mm. the imminent, imminence of war. But at that point, there was a... <coughs> Uh, survivor from the old World War I days of code breaking in the UK, uh, a chap called Professor Frank Adcock, who was a fellow of King's, who had been sort of rehired, if you like, by the Government Code and Cipher School to start recruiting men of the professor type. Now, now some of you may be men of the professor type, <laughs> that means I'm likely to offend some people in the audience, but there's nothing more like a man of the professor type than Alan Turing, very badly dressed. Uh, very eccentric and rather difficult to understand. So, but he started working on the Enigma machine in 1938. With any Polish people in the audience, you might be slightly surprised by that, because if you, it's a sort of a canon of mm. Polish thinking that uh, the Brits took over from the Poles in July 1939. So it's kind of a surprise sometimes to be told that the work on the Enigma had been happening in the UK much earlier. Pinches were absolutely vital. The idea of stealing from the enemy the, the books which told them how they were going to set up the machines during the day, absolutely vital. Couldn't have succeeded at Bursley Park without pinches. I mean, and they had an organised sort of liaison arrangement with the Navy to try and uh, make sure they could get pinches to um, find, out, uh, find out what they needed to, to do to set their bombs up correctly. Let's not ignore real old-fashioned spying, because that's, uh, that's very vital. Machines 
and pinches aren't enough either. You need human techniques. And I think some of the things that the Biloxi Park Codebreakers brought to the table were very interesting. They were understanding of human nature. They were understanding about how bored, stressed German soldiers were going to behave in real life, how they would actually set up their machines, when they were given flexibility, or when indeed they weren't given flexibility, because armies tend to operate in very uh, stereotyped manner. Uh, I can't speak for the present, um, and it would probably not be worth it to do so, even if I pretended to know what was going on at the present. Um, but th this has actually been quite interesting. I've been doing some uh, research recently into uh, where did the origins of 20th century code breaking uh, arise. And uh, the polls, uh, quite rightly, should claim some uh, a good deal of credit for this. But this is very interesting because Poland didn't really exist as a state until 1919. So the polls. Um, were, uh, in terms of their cryptography, were trained essentially by the Austrians um, to look into the rather weak codes that the Tsarist Russia was using. Um, and I think that it's actually probably a root cause of the loss by Tsarist Russia of their position in the First World War, that they were uh, so poor, so weak on, the, on their um, radio communication security. Um, and that carried on into the Bolshevik era, where the Poles were quite happily reading the um, uh, Soviet codes. Um, and uh, now, so then the question is, well, surely there must have come a stage where the Russians had a sort of renaissance and uh, improved their security. I think that must be the case. But uh, I just leave you with the thought that of the not yet declassified material, um, well, uh, which is still presumably in the archive at GCHQ, um, there is uh, um, there's very little in the public domain at the minute about the uh, successes that the um, uh, Western European powers and the Americans had against uh, Russian um, codes. Was 1989 any kind of significant date? Any, anybody got a, a clue what happened in 1989? The Berlin Wall came down. The Berlin Wall came down. Of no importance whatsoever. He was not there. He was not there. So, um, Figo, you, you, that was uh, 1989. That was a life-changing event for you. For, for what reason? Uh, well, in terms of in terms of the work. Yeah, in terms of what we're talking about here. <laughs> focus, man, focus. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was basically a, a, a life-changing year in the sense of the growth of the web technology. And certainly I had no clue or no aspects, aspirations about where it would lead to, because much was, less the fact that it would dominate the rest of my life, hmm. which it certainly has. Um, well, I worked uh, a lot with the CN group, which is the computing group, which is where Tim, Tim Berners-Lee and Robert Cayo, who were primarily the architects of the web. Um, so I became familiar with them, but it was primarily because of collaboration issues between physics labs, um, that it sort of took an interest in that. In particular, uh, a problem of collaboration that existed in our lab. And um, you know, when it seemed as though the web would, could potentially provide a solution for that, you know, anything about history would suggest that the web was an instant success, that everybody just gravitated towards it and saw applications for it, you know, or figured out how to make money from it. It's just not true. Um, and it was fortunate in its history that someone, some group like the NCSA, you know, were trolling around for some place to spend money, and they found the web. Right. This NCSA. NCSA is the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at uh, University of Illinois in Champaign, Urbana, and those were the ones that uh, you know created Mosaic. <clears throat> so not only did they, in that sense, uh, sort of 
take the web to a level that it wouldn't have gotten if it had stayed in the scientific community or the academic community, that enabled things like e-commerce. And that's when, when you started seeing that, that's when you realized, hey, this, is, this thing is really good, has the potential to sort of change the way anybody does anything. Well, it was, well, in some ways, I think, say for the basic internet, <clears throat> it was more self-policing. If you ever use something like Usenet, mm -hmm. if someone did something wrong, you know, the public went after you in that sense. But in terms, in terms of the web, um, as you mentioned, you know, the original proposal that you mentioned, you know, had no reference to security. Um, simply because at that time, you know, it was sort of like this utopian hippie world or whatever, where everything was free, and uh, you know, well, yeah, very, very, very much the yeah, very right. much the very spirit of it, and even the notion that somebody could take this this nice sharing tool and subvert it. I'm not saying that people ignored security, but people did not like the, the major method for security in the early web was the whole idea of security by obscurity. So basically saying, okay, you know, if you make it such that somebody can't find this page, and the way you typically would do that is putting it in a non-standard port, instead of port 80 would be a port 8080 or something like that. So if people couldn't find it, right, then, hey, it's, it's secure. That's a Tim Spiller at the University of York. The, let's say the, the, the two or three main technologies which are at the forefront of research in this area at the moment. Okay, well the hub that I lead is, is actually focused on quantum communication. So what we're trying to do is take basic science ideas and demonstrators that have already been tried and tested over the last few decades and now take those forward and turn them into working technologies. So the things we want to do, uh, we want to we want to take quantum communications and we actually want to put it in devices like this. So we want half of a quantum communication system to sit in the phone in the future, the other half to sit in a device which is owned by a bank or your employer or whatever. And through that you can communicate, set up secure keys that you can then communicate. What we've set ourselves a goal of in the five years that the hub is initially in, in place for is to, is to turn working lab experiments into something that is just about a technology demonstrator, which could be then picked up by one of our industrial partners and commercialised, or it could be spun out in a startup that could start actually commercialising. So we aim to get to that technology commercial ready state after about five years. If you look at things like quantum computing, then we're still a lot further away from, from, from that than five years. So I think, I think you're looking on the decades horizon there for actually having large scale quantum processes. I lived in America for seven years. I was a Guardian correspondent in Washington, then New York. And whenever I spoke to American audiences, I had to apologize. Uh, <laughs> speak really slowly, <laughs> uh, but hopefully that won't be a problem today. I'm one of the least techie people in The Guardian. Um, I've got lots of young colleagues who are fantastic and endlessly tease me about my lack of uh, knowledge. Um, so, but that, so I wasn't the best person to be sent to Hong Kong to interview uh, Snowden, but that's the way it turned out. So the three of us flew to Hong Kong and at the time, I thought this was a hoax. I mean, there's lots of stories that you go and you check out um, and they turn out to be, you know, someone's got the wrong end of the stick or, uh, or, or they're deranged or whatever. Um, <laughs> Snowden Lodfield, uh, who's a former CIA agent, uh, worked for the NSA uh, and uh, was a contractor for the NSA. His speciality was hacking into uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese army, Chinese government, and uh, other targets in China. Um, we put this huge worldwide debate, not so much in Britain. I think if I went out into the street just now and asked, uh, what do you think of Edward Snowden? You know, just doing random uh, interviews uh, around York, uh, I think 
you know, probably nine out of ten, they'd get a blank look. They wouldn't necessarily know who he was. In America or Germany or Brazil or you know other parts of the world, this story has had much more impact. Um, but there has been consequences. In America, uh, just in the last month, we've had uh, changes in legislation. Congress has uh, banned part, some of uh, data collection. Uh, it's been ruled unconstitutional in the federal court in the US. We had uh, two major investigations in Britain. Um, there's been a huge controversy in Germany. Um, this it led to break down in relations between Indonesia and Australia, uh, big changes in Brazil. Uh, people are much more sceptical now than ever before. Hong Kong, again, they were sort of sceptical. We'd let them sceptical. We didn't know if this guy was for real, if it was some sort of elaborate intelligence honey trap. Um, and when we met Snowden, it seemed improbable. Yeah, I, at the very least, you expected somebody who was as old as me, sort of disillusioned with their career prospects. And, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect somebody who was... I mean, Stone at the time was 29, as something said. But although he was 29, he looked about 21. He still does. Um, and then he started to tell his story. Uh, he uh, did go to university, trained with the uh, US Army, Special Forces, broke both his legs. I'm not thinking, this guy's a crank. Uh, especially the Special Forces bit. Then he says, I was a CIA agent in Geneva, uh, worked in uh, Japan for the NSA, uh, worked back in the US uh, for the NSA, uh, worked in Hawaii as an NSA contractor. And I was thinking, it's hard to believe you've done all these things, you know. And he was completely paranoid. And uh, at the time, I thought this was really strange behavior. But I'm as paranoid as he is now, so uh, I saw that. He would do things like, he'd put pillows up against the hotel door jam. So if there's somebody outside eavesdropping, it would make it slightly more difficult. When he was logging onto his uh, laptop, he put a big red hood over his head and over the, the laptop. So that if somebody was spying through the window, or if there was a hidden camera in the room, uh, we, they wouldn't be able to see him put his password in. If he, he hardly ever left his room, and when he did, he would do things like, he'd, put, he'd take soya sauce and put it in a paper napkin, and then put a glass next to it. So if someone came into the room and knocked over the uh, glass, then they would change the pattern of, of the soya sauce in his napkin, and he would know that somebody was in the room. He had all these elaborate things, but talking to him, and he showed us lots of documentation, CIA identification card, driving license, uh, his whole life story was there in his suitcase, and then he started to show us the documents, and there was no way that this was some sort of hoax, some sort of Hitler's diary, and um, it was for real. Why did he do this? Uh, he, he's not left wing, he's not a sort of guardian, natural guardian reader. Uh, when Snowden was in uh, Geneva, he uh, was working with the CIA, and one of the CIA colleagues got a banker. Uh, the CIA was trying to infiltrate a bank, they wanted information about something. They got this banker drunk and then encouraged them to drive home, and then when they were stopped, they cleared it. It was a sort of cynical exercise that intelligence people do all the time. Um, but he was disillusioned with that. He thought it was uh, bad behaviour. Uh, and so the disillusionment started to keep in. And then when he, he looked at the scale of mass surveillance by the NSA, um, I mean, privacy is big in America in a way that it isn't in the UK. Uh, people believe strongly uh, in the right. Uh, privacy. We're here. It's harder to convince people that it matters. He decided that, the, that what the NSA was doing uh, was unconstitutional, um, and that's when they decided to leak. When Obama was elected in 2008, 
he thought this president might make a difference. So he held off uh, leaking the documents. Um, but then after a few years of Obama's uh, presidency, he became disillusioned again. Uh, so when he met myself and Glenn Mora, that was his first contact with the journalistic world. Now he's paid a really high price for what he's done. It's a big sacrifice. He was in Hawaii um, with the, his, his partner was there, uh, uh, Lindsay. Um, he was well paid, and he gave it all up for a principle. He this, at the time, I found it difficult to understand why anybody would sacrifice their life for internet freedom issues. But for Snowden, he regarded it as so important. Um, he was prepared to. He thought that when we were in Hong Kong, he thought he was going to jail for the rest of his life. Um, as far as the US and Britain are concerned, we were breaking the law. Uh, we come under huge pressure from the government, uh, threats, prosecution, uh, threat to put the editor at the time, Alan Rusbridge, are into jail. There's still a criminal prosecution underway, uh, a criminal investigation underway, uh, but I don't think it will go anywhere because they'll probably end up in a freedom of press battle that uh, I don't think this government particularly wants. Um, but what, there was an incident where eventually they said, look, you can't have these documents in Britain. You have to get rid of them or we're going to close you down, or at least close down the, the reporting of uh, Stone. Uh, so two uh, officials from uh, the British Surveillance Agency, GCHQ, came to the Guardian and oversaw the disruption of the Guardian computers on which the Stone stories had been written. The, um, I, I'm not anti-intelligence, uh, I'm not anti-GCHQ, I understand there's a need for intelligence. Uh, we need uh, the intelligence agencies engaged in tracking terrorists or paedophiles or prim international criminal gangs. Um, I've come across spies in the Middle East and elsewhere uh, doing positive things, you know, trying to work for peace in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, or in Northern Ireland, they helped broker the, uh, they did awful things there, but they also helped broker the peace. Um, the, as I said, people who associate the NSA or GCHQ with, say, the Stasi in Germany, I mean, that's absurd. It doesn't help the privacy cause at all when you make such uh, that level of exaggeration. But it doesn't mean there isn't a case to answer. I mean, you can have total security, or you can have uh, total privacy, um, but I think for most people, the balance is someplace in the middle, and that's where the argument lies. You know how much security you have, how much privacy. Um, I said that I basically, um, I'm not anti-intelligence, but I still believe uh, again from that previous session, you need proper political and judicial oversight of the intelligence agency.